Greetings, brothers and sisters. Um, you guys might remember the greatest seagull of all time. I've talked about that. And I made a video about this seagull who made it into a grocery store, snagged a sandwich for himself, and then left the store. Could have been a she, I don't know. Hard to tell. But the animals are starting to want in. They want in, not just insects and smaller animals, but they want in in human life. One of my viewers on Instagram sent me this thing. So here's a, here's a uh, flamingo. Flamingo wants to go into the gift shop because, you know, why wouldn't you? So it's like, all right, I'm going to go in after. This guy's great. Watch this guy here. He's the key figure. And this flamingo's like, all right, I'm going in. The guy's like, hey. He's trying to hold the door for the flamingo. He's going to come back. Ready? Oh, <laughs> let's do that again. So that guy, so flamingo's like, all right, I'm going to the gift shop. And he's holding the door for his grandmother or something like that. And he's like, oh, wait, there's a flamingo trying to get in. Oh, <laughs> he reaches back to make sure the flamingo can go in. Flamingo's got to go in slow because of the grandmother. And he made it into the gift shop. So I'm telling you, these animals want in. They don't. They're not. They're tired of waiting on the outside. So I um have some stuff to do with JoJo, and CNN did a hit piece on um uh, on Tucker Carlson. I haven't watched it yet, but it's basically comparing him to Alex Jones, and I want to get to that in a moment with Brian Stelza. And so um we got some you know politics stuff coming up, but first. When it comes to symbols of the past, there are still a lot of people who ascribe extra natural powers to symbols. Symbols is about symbols. This would have been more important, I don't know. Here's the interpretation of symbols by Robert Langdon. They've got rid of Tom Hanks, but Ron Howard's still making it. There's a pentagram up there. Natural powers to symbols. Sign of the cross, number 13. Luck symbols. Bad luck symbols. At what point, though, do benign symbols? What point do benign symbols? He says benign symbols. And it looks like she's doing the 666 here. Benign symbols become malignant. Malignant symbols. You're one of the sharpest students I've ever had. Raw intellect can only take you so far. Peter, I knew this was going to be life threatening. I would have just gone to the library. <laughs> He's funny. With over 200 million copies in print worldwide. Professor Langdon? I was expecting Peter. He asked me to let you know about an urgent situation. Hello? You will solve the great mystery. It's the great mystery of our time. Opie's directing this one. He's Opie's the executive producer. Peter will point the way. Boom! Stu's pointing up, as above, so below. Peter's ring. As above, so below. As above, so below. They got some JoJo whispers. They got Alec Baldwin, JoJo Magoo whisper here. As above, so below. That's Peter's ring. As above, so below. They did it. He said it. Catherine, something's happened. And your dad, he's been taken. They've taken his dad. I don't know exactly what's going on. It's a mystery. I teach symbology. I expect you'll find the sun, the lantern, and a key. The hand of the mysteries. The mysteries are there. Did this person say what? The dawn of a global conspiracy. Say what he wants? He wants me to locate an ancient portal buried within the capital and unlock it. The ancient portal, I think there was a pyramid of some sort. Portal buried within the capital and unlock it. How's your Latin? Not as good as my Arabic. Did you happen to put that key back? You mean this? No, no. He took the key. He, he took the key. No one told me to put it back. Nobody told him to put it back. What do you expect? You didn't think it was going to be that easy, did you? No, it's never that easy. There's a purpose to everything he's done. The world wants to be deceived. So let it be deceived. The world wants to be deceived. 
So go ahead and let it be deceived. A lot of symbols in this one. Okay, so it used to be that um, symbology was important. I used to make a lot more videos about symbology. But now, you know, they're rolling out the plan in full force. So it's not as interesting, right? <laughs> because we've moved beyond the, the step of foreshadowing and symbols. But let's uh, go to Jojo Magoo. So Jojo Magoo went to rural Michigan on July 3rd. You know, they're just rolling Magoo out now. Magoo isn't, they're not hiding Magoo as, as much because people have accepted that he, you know, he's made some horrific gaffes. I mean, everything that he did when he was in Europe for the, what was that, G7. And so, like, he was just out there making gaff after gaff and being stupid and being, you know, a lost person. And it didn't matter because the American public is numb to it at this point. They've accepted that Jojo Magool, Jojo, Jojo, Jojo Magool is a doddering old fool. And so um, they're just rolling him out. And he's wandering around lost, doing stuff. He's in a cherry pie shop here. <laughs> wandering around, making stupid gaffes. And people are just like, oh, that's our president. And uh, we've got uh, dried cherries. We have canned cherries, applesauce and salsa. My sister-in-law's homemade jam. They got her sister's. They got her sister-in-law's homemade jam. This is Magoo. Like, Magoo's got problems going on, but, you know, he's got enough time to talk about. He's a president. There's crises going on in the world, but he just wants to have a happy July 4th. He's going into a pie shop, and he's going to buy some of her sister-in-law's homemade jam. Yeah, you got to have an apple top. Homemade jam made by my sister-in-law in small batches. It's small batch jam. <laughs> You got that, Magoo? It's <laughs> Our favorite, up there, raspberry jelly. Um, one of her favorites is the hungry. <laughs> and raspberry. How about that? <laughs> okay, so it's the audio and the video aren't great quality. That's just the way it is. But, um, you know, Jojo Magoo getting it done in the pie shop. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently they got cameras from um, <laughs> the 1970s. They should have gave him a basket. Like, you know, what, what, Magoo doesn't know how to shop. He's just glowing everything up in his arms, homemade jam. Do have um, uh, more than one of these pies? We do have some more down um, down across the apricot that we can grab to, for you. I don't to do that. Uh, oh, we got a lot of more than one pie. Yeah, we'll get them some more. <laughs> Jojo's got to have his pie. He's here for some pie. He's going to get his pie. That's not a problem. They'll have to suffer through blueberry pie. Let's get a blueberry pie. Too. Blueberry? Okay. It's a cherry pie store. He's there picking cherries because he went up to Cherry Farms. This is a chip. This is a trip about cherries. George Washington cutting down the cherry tree, Fourth of July cherries. But he's gonna have to suffer through a blueberry pie in a cherry county. Who heard of such a thing? It's important. This is important stuff for Magoo. He's not doddering around. He's making big decisions here. Okay, put that, those in a different box. All right, blueberry and the which other one? The cherry raspberry? He wants, to, he, wants, he wants his two pies in different boxes. He just He's laying it down. He's making decisions here. He doesn't want both pies put in one box. <laughs> like slammed together. Blueberry? Okay. Okay, put that, those in a different box. All right, blueberry and the which other one? The cherry raspberry? Yes, that one. Yep. Yeah? Okay. And then these three are yours? Yep. All right. He's Thank you. Lost. He's pretty lost right here. Look at him. Like he's just, you know, he's having trouble negotiating the cherry pie store. He's got every staff member there. They've cleared out everybody else. He's got plenty of help, you know. <laughs> and then these three are yours? Yep. All right. Thank you. She's talking to Magool like he's a child. <laughs> 
Listen how condescending she's being. <laughs> Want me to wipe your chin for you? <laughs> and then these three are yours? Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. Here, this one I got to... Oh, I thought you already got it. Now I got to check it out. It's getting his wallet out. How are you doing today? Good. A little warm out there. <laughs> Take your sunglasses off, Joe. You're inside for, for heaven's sakes. How about a box? Yeah. Staff, you're going to carry the sodas. Yeah, go get it. Here, let me just have that. Do you want any of the sodas open? All right. Are you drinking it right away or are we waiting? No, no, no. Okay. Way to get to it's poor quality video of this epic trip to the cherry pie store. Mr. President, let me know if I can ask you a question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right now, sir? Yeah. Uh, with the most recent hack by the Russians. Okay, so this woman's asking about the Russian hack. <laughs> Like you can ask ask you a question, like a real question. You know, not about the pies, because you know you're president, and I have you here. I want to ask about the Russian hack, and JoJo isn't ready to go. Would you say that this this means we're that... not sure it's the Russians? Okay, with I spot gun okay. I got a brief on the as I was on the plane. That's why I was late getting off the plane. Okay, good. At least you've explained yourself. We were expecting you here 15 to 20 minutes ago. You came in late. Okay, I guess you got some sort of an excuse with this briefing, but you know we had important pie store business to attend to. I got a brief and uh, it's good. Stick it right in there. All right. Would you like your receipt? Do you know who it might be, sir? Uh, I'll be in better shape to talk to you about it. After I've had my medication, I <laughs> just come in here for some pies. I wasn't expecting some serious questions from the pie ladies. I'm gonna pull out my notes. I'll tell you what they sent me. Okay. They sent him something. He's got his notes here. Uh, that, uh, the idea. First of all, we're not sure who it is for certain, number one. And what I did, I directed the full resources of the, of the government to... So you devoted 100% of our government, the military, the school systems, the roads, the national parks, all the federal employees, every single resource within the federal government, <laughs> you devoted it to this uh, Russian hacking thing? The idea... First of all, we're not sure who it is for certain, number one. And what I did, I directed the full resources of the, of the government to assist in a response if we determine. What else you need? Oh, nothing. You're all set. Okay. You're all set. You got your credit card. You pay for your pies. Okay. You can Now you can do. You can multitask. You can answer this question about the hackers. You can make your, your pie transaction. Okay. And... Um, uh, the fact is that uh, I directed the intelligence community to give me a, a deep dive on what's happened. He's making a deep dive. They're making a deep dive as he's in the pie shop. There's deep diving going on in the government while JoJo's deep diving into cherry pie land. A deep dive on what's happened, and I'll know better uh, tomorrow. And if it is, uh, either with the knowledge of and or a consequence of Russia, then... I told Putin we will respond. And, uh, you didn't but, tell him already, sir? No, no, I haven't called oh. because we're not, we're not certain. He doesn't know for sure where the hat came from. He just wants to have his freaking cherry pie, right, lady? I just want my freaking cherry pie. I'm not working. It's July 3rd. Give me some good news, man. I want to talk about happy things, man. The initial thinking was it was not the Russian government, um, but we're not sure. So now everybody's asking questions. He's all confused. He's lost. I just want my pies. They're firing questions at him. They're asking about Shakiri Richardson. 
Those are the press. We're all going to the right. Right. What is it about Michigan coming on the eve of Independence Day? What brought you here? Cherry pie. He came here for the cherry pie. So you spent whatever fortune it is, like a million dollars, to fly Air Force One out to Michigan and all these people, you know, all the expense that this costs the government millions of dollars to take some sort of a trip so you could get some cherry pie in Michigan. <laughs> You've heard of the Internet, right, Joe? <laughs> Magoo, you know about the Internet, don't you? <laughs> Look, it's the, the rules are the rules. The rules are the rules, man. The rules are the rules. No malarkey. And everybody knows that the rules we're going in, whether they should remain that, that should remain the rules, a different issue. He's got some honey syrup behind him. <laughs> There's honey and syrup with this wonderful uh, homemade sign. We're going in, whether they should remain that, that should remain the rules, a different issue. But the rules are rules, and I was really proud of the way she responded. And uh, so, okay, thank you, guys. Thanks. Can I get my cherry pie and go? I'm tired of answering questions about Shakira Richardson and Russia. The one thing that I um, want to say about the Shakira Richardson thing is, I didn't articulate it well enough in my video about discipline, is that you have a generation, the younger generations, it's probably, I guess, two generations from young kids to people in their 30s that have a problem with finality and discipline and rules being rules. I mean, this is something that, unfortunately, me and Magoo agree on, that the rules are the rules, right? And so young people are used to not having parents who discipline them. We have the liberal people more than the conservative people. But this idea of losing something permanently, that Shakiri Richardson is not going to run in the Olympics. Like they can't grasp the finality that it's already over. There's no way she's going. It's not going to be reversed. There's nothing anybody can do about it. She broke the rules. And they're just so used to not having finality and discipline where their parents will, you know, be wishy-washy and not give them real discipline. They'll, guess it, they'll give them discipline and they'll feel bad and, you know, they'll suspend it. You know, they won't follow through on it or whatever. So this generation doesn't understand consequences. They think there's still there's a chance that Shakari Richardson will run in the Olympics and don't understand the international aspect about this and that it's already over. Thank you, Brad. Mr. President, one on Surfside, do you have a comment on I'm just trying to get my cherry pie, man. They will have to demolish the remaining part of the tower. No, I don't. I've not been briefed by FEMA uh, whether or not that is wise that they've reached that decision. Uh, Figure it, guys. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. He's confused. Like, JoJo's always confused. I mean, we know that, that JoJo gets confused a lot because he is breaking down mentally. But it's been accepted. The American people either refuse to see it or don't care. And so, you know, you got this doddering old fool, Joe Go Joe Joe Magool, <laughs> walking through walking through pie shops and barely able to function and get the transactions done. Why people are firing questions at him. <laughs> A day of history, of hope, remembrance and resolve of pro Jojo has two two switches. He has there he is right there. His ghoul hole open. He's got yelling Jojo Magoo where you know get off my lawn, lawn Jojo. Come on man, right you know that Jojo. And he's got the doddering old confused whispering fool, right? He's got like either it's like whispering Jojo Magoo. I don't know what to do. Am I okay? I'm all set here. Then he's got his get off my lawn. Yeah, come on man. Yeah, he's got he's got two um volume switches it's either it's either one or 11 right promise and possibilities before me stands monuments of the greatest and the goodness of our nation the greatest and the goodness these monuments right before him are monuments about greatness and goodness monuments of light and liberty 
There's a towering memorial to George Washington, the general who led our revolution, and the president who set our nation on its course. A Freemason, and they have a Freemasonic obelisk that JoJo was talking about, this monument, right? The obelisk of the Washington Monument. There's a memorial to Thomas Jefferson, whose words about liberty and equality literally changed. A guy who um, impregnated his 15-year-old slave. And, you know, you can't have a... There he is with his ghoul hole open again. He's got the ghoul hole going. But Thomas Jefferson had three children with his 15-year-old slave, Sally Hemmings, which is a abusive relationship. And those children were all his slaves. And so think about that, right? And Thomas Jefferson's considered one of the best poly, you know, one of the best sort of leaders. He wrote some great documents on liberty, but didn't practice what he preached. Changed the world. And across the tidal basin, from the Jefferson Memorial, there stands Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His arms crossed, his eyes fixed ahead toward the... You know, Martin Luther King Jr. had, um, the FBI had, like, files uh, on him because they were spying on him. He was, like, cheating on his wife and, I mean, a bunch of stuff, right? I mean, all these guys, he's talking about statues now, right? Like, we're, this is one of the signs of the apocalypse where you no longer have heroes in real life. You no longer have people to look up to because everyone's a complete psychological mess. And so you're just like, hey, look at those statues over there when we used to be great. And you have people who were statutized were never great in the first place. The promised land where equality is not only an aspiration, but a reality. <laughs> Woo! Woo! They help define who we are, guide what we do, remind us of the work that history has given us in our own time this year see he's he's even clueless with um he's clueless with like this is a is a speech he's reading and it's a pre-written speech and so you know he's better at reading speeches trump was better at talking off the cuff but even with this speech it's a bad speech and he's lost like he's you know like he's not delivering it well here the 4th of July is a day of special celebration for we are emerging from the darkness of years. The darkness of years. We're emerging from the darkness of years of Mordor. For we are emerging from the darkness of years. A year of pandemic and I A year of pandemic and isolation. We're emerging like the groundhog crawling out of its hole. Isolation, a year of pain, fear, and heartbreaking loss. Just think back to where this nation was a year ago. Yeah, we weren't be able to go out the 4th of July because of bogus rules. <laughs> think that we're being imposed to get Trump out of office. We remember where we were, Emmett Ever. We're, do you remember where you were? <laughs> think back to where you were a year ago. Where were you, though, Jojo Bakul? Go and think about how far we've come from silent streets. Woo! Woo! From silent streets to crowded parade routes lined with people waving American flags. From empty stadiums and arenas to fans back in their seats cheering together again. Together again. He did that with his... We, he brought America back from where they pushed it into so they could defeat Trump. From families pressing hands against a window to grandparents hugging their grandchildren once again. We're back traveling again. We're back seeing one another again. Businesses are opening and hiring again. It's just crazy. Like, how did that happen? I just, I don't know. It's just wonderful. All the wonderful policies that Joel Joe Magool put out there to, you know, fix the country that was forced to shut down <laughs> by the people that handle and run Joe Joe Magool. 
We're seeing record job creation and record economic growth. The best in four decades. And I might add, the best in the world. It's the best in the world. We're the greatest. It's like he made America great again. Jojo McGool, he, he's channeling Trump. Like they've taken a bunch of Trump's sort of rhetoric and they're using it. Like this is the make America great again stuff. I mean, they've been pushing Trumpisms for a while. I showed you this thing the other day where he was acting just like Trump. And the, the problem with what he's saying is, so this is um, how much more does it cost to live in Joe Biden's America? And 2020 versus 2021, 1,000 feet of lumber cost $1,500 now, used to be $300, gallon of gas, $1.95, 305 a ton of wheat, $183, and now it's uh, almost $100 more, 251 A ton of coal is double the price. One bushel of corn, which is the big one because that feeds the world, it's responsible for so many uh, processed foods, is basically doubled in price, 343 to 686 In fact, it's exactly doubled in price. And that's because of all the bailout. Now, this isn't completely on Joe, Joe McGool. This is the economy he inherited, but it certainly isn't Trump's fault in the sense that they forced him, they baited Trump into closing the country. You know, Trump was completely managed and handled. He got rolled. He got worked. 2020, Trump got worked on every level, you know, and he closed the economy and all the other things that went with it. And then all the stuff that happened globally the global economy, and America had to print a lot of money, all this bailout money. It's going to probably end up being $10 trillion of just straight-up debt, straight-up inflation, right, and the devaluation of the American currency. And so hard assets, these things in the middle, are all going up because the value of the dollar has gone down. Now, JoJo inherited this as president, but the people that run JoJo pushed this on Trump, right? They wanted this to, they wanted the economy to fail so JoJo would get elected and then it would look like JoJo is fixing the economy because all they really did was open America back up after, you know, exaggerating the COVID stuff and all these things to force Trump to do something that ended up causing all of this, you know, economic breakdown. JoJo's bragging like Trump did. Look at all we've accomplished. That's what Trump used to always do and the media used to hammer them on it, it's false numbers, right? When you close down a country, <laughs> you force everyone to stay inside, and people can't go and do their jobs, only essential workers, and then you open it back up, there is going to be an economic revival, but it's not real because the dollar has been devalued. And the real problem was that Trump, because of his handlers, and because of you know the, the economy never being, it can never be strong again, because there's too much debt, opened up the Wall Street stuff and the banker stuff again, because, you know, it had to happen to create economic growth. And they just accumulated more derivative debt and all this stuff. I've showed you this before. And so that's why where we are now, like the economy collapsed in 2019, but no one acknowledged it. They had to, you know, they couldn't say, oh, we did it again. We did the same thing we did in 2008. Because the economy isn't working anymore. There's just too much debt. There's no way to get around it. And so whoever's president is screwed. And now they're just fudging the numbers to make it seem like, you know, and now see, oh, look, we're making it better again. So let's get back to Jojo McGool's um, speech here. And, you know, the magic of motion pictures. <laughs> it seems like no time has passed, but I went to eat breakfast. <laughs> It's about 45 minutes since I was making the first part of this video. But anyways, Jojo McGool's up on stage here giving his 4th of July speech. Today, all across this nation, we can say with confidence, America is coming back together. America's coming back together. I'm going to make this bold statement. America, we made America great again. 245 years ago, we declared our independence from a distant king. Today, 
we are closer than ever to declaring our independence from a deadly virus. Wow, imagine that. Like, think about the, the odds of that thing. He looks confused again. They declared our independence from a distant king, but now we're doing it from a virus. This is Independence Day. That's not to say the battle against COVID-19 is over. It's just, in, it's in an intermission. We've got a lot more work to do. But just as our declaration in 1776 was not a call to action, was a call to action, not a reason for... <laughs> it was not a call to action. Like he's reading and he still messed it up. Let's watch that again. It, I was like, wait, it, you're saying it's not a call to action? <laughs> But then he corrected himself. Not a call to action. Was a call to action, not a reason for complacency or a claim of victory. It was a call to action. The same is true today. But first you said it wasn't a call to action. Which one are we supposed to believe? You've given two different stories. Back then we had the power of an idea on our side. Today we have the power of... Please don't say science. Science. It was just an idea. Ideas were, you know, not as powerful. But now we got science, which is so powerful, it's way powerful. We got the power of science. But didn't science create the problem? <laughs> you know, from Fauci's leaked emails and all these revelations, didn't science, even John Stewart said science created this problem. So, uh, you know, we have the problem of science. <laughs> idea on our side today we have the power of science. We've gained the upper hand against this virus. We can live our lives. Our kids can go back to school. Our economy is roaring back. Don't get me wrong. COVID-19 has not been vanquished. But you said the power of science. We all know powerful variants have emerged. Like, but what about the power of science? You just said, like, what, what are you saying? The Delta variant. But the best defense against these variants is the power of science. And so um, I want to move on from this thing. But the 4th of July is not my favorite holiday. I don't like holidays in general because they are days that people are, you know, have the idea that it's supposed to be a special day. Anything that ends up Anything that's pitched as a special day and somehow is supposed to be better than other days. And then you involve family. <laughs> yeah. Is going to go south, right? I mean, how many times you have had a disappointment on a holiday and, you know, you think the day is going to be better than other days. And it's actually worse. And oftentimes there's lots of stress. But Fourth of July in particular is the firework aspect. And, you know... The fireworks are neat the first time you see it. We have a lot of fireflies, which are, to me, much better than fireworks. They come out every night. They're peaceful. They give out a cold light, which is kind of a, you know, almost like a, a miracle of, um, you know, animal technology. They have these lights. They just light up the night, you know. But you have fireworks that light up the sky, but they are based in gunpowder, which has a, you know, to me, an unpleasant odor. And then there's just the loudness of it. And if you go to your, your local city's um, 4th of July celebration, it's just crowded. You know, it's just a whole thing. Parking, there's always never enough. You know, <laughs> There's a whole thing with that. And I just uh, am not into it. And last night here, our cows, because people are setting off fireworks all over the place, our cows got freaked out. And they're running around the yard and, one of them got up, got into our front stoop and urinated because, you know, they came to the, we have a front area in the front of our house and they got up on the porch. They often get up on the porch and peed all over it. And cow urine is like, when a cow urinates, it's like two gallons. I mean, it's a, it's a, the volume of it. And, um, you know, it's a very pungent odor. So our whole, every time we open the door, we can still smell it even after washing it off. They got to go power wash the thing today. And so when the cows just get freaked out and they always look at me or, you know, whoever's out there. 
they always look at the people like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> some drunken fool is blowing his thumbs off, you know, 10 houses away. Right? Even the cows look at me like, what are you doing? Like it's all, you know, whatever is happening around us. If it's, uh, you know, neighbors are doing construction, there's loud noises. The cows always blame you or whoever's out there at the time. So it's just something that I'm not, you know, I mean, fireworks in general are somewhat dangerous. You got a lot of drunk people. I mean, I've seen this happen in my life, right? So there's this place in South Carolina called South of the Border. And um, when you drive, well, we, my family and I used to drive from Connecticut to Florida. And South of the Border, it's grown. It was a small place, I think, when my family first started to drive through South Carolina on their way to Florida to see my grandparents. But it has grown astronomically over the years. It's got its own, uh, it's got its own website now. I mean, it's, um, it's called a world famous South of the border home of America's favorite highway oasis and getaway to the Southeast. And the reason it's so successful, here's this guy, it's Pedro. Now it's, you know, borderline racist because the guy who owns this thing is not Mexican, right? <laughs> as far as I know, it's some rich millionaire redneck who has this guy Pedro as the um, as their symbol. You never sausage a place. You're always a wiener at Pedro's south of the border in 10 miles. And the reason that south of the border is so successful is they have about a hundred billboards, keep yelling kids, they'll stop, <laughs> and 29 miles. And they have like a hundred miles out, you start seeing these these um, these billboards. And so the kids just bother their parents until they stop here. And it's a really cheesy, um, you know, just cheesy. It's got all this like stuff like, you know, Mostly has some um, gift shops. Everything's overpriced. When I was a kid, they charged you to use the bathroom, like 10 cents to get into the stalls. And it's just, here's the, you know, all this gift shop stuff. But they sell fireworks, right? And, you know, in, in Connecticut, there was no fireworks. You live in a northern state. You live in a democratic state. And there's all these rules and restrictions. But in south of the border, they sell fireworks. And when I was a kid, I had a couple of firework experiences. Once I went to school and I was like maybe five or six, really young. And there were some older kids in elementary school had gotten some of those like, you know, small fireworks that, you know, not like an M80, but a smaller one. And they were throwing it at littler kids. And one of them, you know, my friends were standing and I were standing there and someone threw a firework at us and it exploded like right near my head and my ear and like, you know, my ear was ringing, right? Like, you know, and I was too young to even process <laughs> what had happened. But anyways, my one time my dad bought me a few, like, small fireworks. Like, we used to get sparklers and, like, all those kind of lame things. But one of the things he got me was this thing that was about the size of a shotgun shell, like half a shotgun shell. And you'd light it, and it would turn colors and fly, right? It was like, a, you know, it would fly around and turn colors and then, you know, just sort of fizzle out. And I didn't use it right away. It was in my room. And at some point I saw it. It was like the middle of the winter. It might have been like six months later. You know, I have no way to tell, but it had been a long time. I was like, oh, man, I didn't shoot this thing off. And I decided to open up the my window. And there's a Flamingos, another reference to Flamingos. Uh, too much tequila. When you When you leave... When you go past uh, south of the border, there's a few billboards that say, you missed us, turn around, go back, right? But anyway, so I lit the thing off, and it didn't make it out the window. <laughs> it came back into the room, and it was going pretty fast, and it was flying around the room, bouncing around like a bullet ricocheting off of the walls of a submarine. Like it flew by me a couple times, and it's changing colors, and then it all of a sudden stopped, but it was still, you know, burning. And it landed on a blanket and set the blanket afire. <laughs> I 
I have a few times I almost burned my parents' house down. <laughs> I got a couple of, of stories that happened. Uh, time for a pause south of the border. And so, um, you know, and I got some water and I threw it on the blanket, went out. But the whole room stunk like for for like weeks. It smelled like smoke in there. Probably maybe never stopped. I don't know. I mean, it really was bad. My mom found the blank and she's like, you know, what happened? And I'm like, I don't know. A couple of dopey parents handed their seven-year-old kid a, a firework. <laughs> and, you know, that happened, right? And so anyways, as I got older, I realized that fireworks weren't so great. My brother has a story where, um, you know, he was with his family and they were shooting out fireworks for the local town. And, you know, those fireworks that that are, you know, the expensive fireworks that shoot up into the air and, and there's this lights and stuff. And he could hear the fireworks, you could hear the fireworks be shot off. There's a, a sound and he, you know, says it sounds very much like a mortar, you know, something he heard in Vietnam. And he would count because that's what you would do until the mortar went off. And one of the fireworks didn't explode when it should, right? And so he got the blanket and he, you know, and he threw it over his family and people were laughing and he said, you know, then all of a sudden the firework came down into the crowd, right? And so, you know, there's lots of mishaps because it's basically explosions. And Fourth of July is a warlike celebration, which I'm not a fan of, right? It's glorifying war. We're a very warlike people. But even in India, when I was in India, there was a holiday called Diwali. And I was there for two of them that I can remember. And Diwali is a festival of lights. It's supposed to be a celebration of light. And when it first came out, it probably had to do with internal light, you know, divinity within or something, whatever the holiday was meant to be. But now it's about fireworks. And just like in America, there are people who will set fireworks off on June 30th or July 1st because they can't wait to the 4th of July to blow their thumbs off. Right? <laughs> and in India, it's a week-long fireworks that are people are setting fireworks off at four in the morning and if you look around it's just explosions throughout the whole city i mean it's brutal and it's loud and it isn't like the good fireworks that shoot off the lights you know the things that we think about celebration a lot of it's just loud noises and explosions and we would walk home from the ashram to our you know to where we were staying at this you know, this this uh, sort of flat or whatever it is, you know, apartment. And we'd have to walk through the streets and people would be setting off fireworks everywhere. And you wouldn't, you just walk up on them. There was this old woman, old ass woman, like 70 years old. And she went out to the street and lit some fireworks that just made loud noises and exploded and then ran into her house. I walked around the corner as she was going into her house and I stopped my kids. I'm like, wait. And then it was the fireworks. But if we had kept on walking, it would have like, you know, hurt us, right? It would have been, we would have walked right on top of it. There's pictures in India where, you know, cows have walked up and had their faces, like their jaw blown off and other animals because they have dogs wandering the streets. People just walk out in the middle of a city and set a firework off in a road and then, you know, run away from it. But other people are walking around the city or animals or whatever. It's just really stupid. And like I said, it went on for a week. And it's just, it's it sounds like, you know, you're at war. I mean, there's just explosions all night for seven days. And you can't sleep. And I'm like, you know, the smell of gunpowder is just horrible. And like, there's just a stupidity there. And a glorification of war. Just thought I'd throw this in there. <laughs> this is my fireworks meal. But I'm just not a big fan of holidays. That's why I don't usually say anything about them because I don't, you know, I mean, are we independent? I, the whole idea of the 4th of July now and Jojo Magool and all these things, it is, um, you know, it's jumped the shark. I mean, it's never been great. And now we know about the Freemasons, of course, there were slaves and, you know, all these other aspects to what was really going on in America. And so, but there's never really been independence because we're more dependent than ever on the system that I call the beast. Who's independent, right? They say Americans are free. Yeah, you're free to be a slave to the system. 
but can you live off this? Can you live without your addictions to the system? We're hundred percent dependent on this system for our survival, and you know, a system that's collapsing. But anyways, damning CNN supercut reveals who Tucker Carlson really sounds like now. The Fox News host sounds a lot like America's most notorious conspiracy theorist. And we got Brian Steltza. <laughs> Steltza, Steltza, Steltza. There they are. Alex, Alex P. Jones and Tucker P. Carlson. Choose your own reality culture. Brian Steltza bringing it. You know, there's something going on there. <laughs> There's something going on here, like just, um, I don't know, it's the high voice, the feminine, fe- I don't know what's going on there, Brian. Is pervading every corner of American life. Choose your own reality. If you Choose your own reality, not the reality that CNN and the CIA and the government and, the, and Hollywood, which is about distorting reality. Movies are about distorting reality. If you want to believe that the pro-Trump riots of January 6th were instigated by the feds, you can choose a show that claims that is true. You can choose a TV star who claims it's real. If you want to believe the NSA is reading your favorite TV star's emails, go right ahead. He claims it's true. The NSA is you just believe in your own reality. The NSA doesn't spy on anybody, even though it's their job to spy on people. <laughs> even though it was revealed by Snowden that they spied on everything. They gathered everything. That was a real news story, Brian, <laughs> that the NSA spies on everybody. It's just whether they access that material, but they're gathering everything. Everything that's being done is being gathered in, like, huge supercomputers. The amount of memory, right, the amount of storage, computer storage that's used is you know, almost unfathomable to all of us, right? Beyond terabytes. NSA denies it, of course, but for Tucker Carlson's fans, that's just further proof of the plot. Car- NSA denied it. Why would they, why would they ever lie? <laughs> why would the government ever lie, Brian? Carlson is a conspiracy monger, but he's far from the first. As my colleague Oliver Darcy pointed out this week, Carlson is sounding more and more like InfoWars host, and notorious conspiracy theorist, Alex Jones. He sounded like Jones. You can hear the similarities. The NSA has been reading our emails. It's not that I think the government spies on me. Uh, It's admitted that they do. It is a lie to say there are no risks. There are risks in everything, including in getting a vaccine. Everybody's got family that got killed or got sick from a vaccine. So FBI operatives were organizing the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, according to government documents. It is overwhelming the evidence that criminal elements of the federal government provocateured and staged January 6th. So this is what I've said over and over again about Alex Jones. Alex Jones, people are like, well, he woke so many people up and, you know, they credit Alex Jones for being sort of one of the pioneers of what's now become the truth community. And most people have realized that Alex Jones is a shill, you know, COINTELPRO, and he is a, like, paid asset or controlled asset of the intelligence communities. And what he gives to them, what he gives to the controlling system, is he's acted crazy, emotional, and put out disinformation and been exposed, and then they can therefore use him as an example because Alex Jones has said things that are factually accurate, but they can use him as an example when anybody else goes truther, right? Now, Tucker Carlson's starting to go more and more truther, but because of the QBs and because Alex Jones, they have successfully created this um, idea of people who are truthers, crazy conspiracy theorists, are mentally ill. And Alex Jones, with his rants and his emotions and you know all these things that he did, Cohen, Cointel Pro stuff, was able to develop this narrative that's being used time and time again to beat people in the truth community, you know, to make them sound illegitimate, right? And this is... You know, but I mean, it's just so lame that CNN 
which sucks so bad, right? Turd and stage January 6th. All right, Oliver Darcy. Look at this guy coming in, shaking his head. Oh, it's so horrible. Look at this clown. <laughs> Watch him as he as they, they bring this this thing in here. Turd and stage January 6th. All right, Oliver Darcy. It's Darcy's just so sad. Me. I think the sound speaks for itself. Is it a stretch to say that Tucker Carlson is the new Alex Jones? It's it's not a stretch, Brian. It, it, Tucker Carlson. It's not a stretch, Brian. Brian, it's not a stretch at all. He's the new Alex Jones. See, what you have here is a concerted effort by social media, the government, to some extent, Hollywood, and the mainstream media to say to you that the government would never lie to you. Right? <laughs> you understand this? Like Hollywood... If you look at Hollywood movies and TV shows, the majority of them have governmental conspiracies and, you know, where the government is lying to you, tricking you. I mean, you've seen them, right? And yet Hollywood celebrities, the mainstream media, and, you know, all these various entities, now social media, are pretending like all of the stuff the government does, unless it was Trump, when Trump was president, he lied to you. You know, individuals will. But for the most part, these institutions, corporations, Hollywood, mainstream media, social media, you know, all these institutions would never do you any harm. They're all benevolent, right? They're benevolent institutions that are all for the common good and are trying to help them. And you should trust them completely. And anybody who dares to speak against them. And it's getting tighter and worse. You know, years ago, people asked me when I would, you know, make these types of videos. And of course, my videos were of a different, they're much lighter now. And, you know, I have a different sense of the thing. And I'll come back to that. And I've talked about that recently. But I, you know, much lighter about all these things. But when I used to make videos about this, people would say to me, well, are you scared for your life? And I know there's a lot of truthers out there that are claimed they're being harassed and attacked. And, you know, maybe that's the case. I don't know. I'm not, you know, I can't say for certain, but I know it's come up over the years. But I used to say, and I, you know, still firmly believe this, why would they do me harm if they could just, you know, get rid of my YouTube channel, right? And I also see the sense of the audience because people, you know, think that they're reaching some big audience. And, you know, if you have 100,000 views on your video, it's nothing. It's not, you know, it's not going to influence anybody in any real direction. And so, you know, it's the collective groups of people who are posting things on social media that the government's more worried about. It's the, you know, it's all of the people, not just a few, you know, standout people. But the first stage would be to start censoring people because they could you know, they had the ability to close out your accounts. And now now that's happening, right? So that's stage one, where if you speak out against the institutions, and some institutions are more, you know, you have less, um, you know, they silence you more than others, then you're censored and attacked and you're put in this dangerous category. And they're using January 6th as an example of what this type of information sharing can do. They're using what happened on January 6th. People don't realize what a horrible thing that was for people wanting to be able to express themselves on the internet because now they have an example of something they can say, look, if you guys you know, talk about things in a way where you're anti the government or whatever it might be, this is the kind of thing that can happen and this thing happened. So therefore we have to silence you. And so, you know, this is this idea that the government and all these institutions would never do you any harm, that people aren't liars, and just individual people, or Fox News to some extent, and Tucker Carlson. Now, Fox News is responsible for a lot of this stuff because Fox News was the first news network to start being very opinionated and put out fear porn, like fear propaganda, for the right-wing people. And it was killing MSNBC and CNN in the ratings, and they couldn't understand why. And so 
And they were too, they didn't want to go the route of Fox News. They thought they were above it and they were journalists. But then they saw how well Fox News was doing and it just became the right time for the, you know, the intelligence the intelligence agencies to order their media shills to start to become opinionated. So they all just followed suit and now they're even worse than Fox News. Like they're more, you know, they're much more propaganda than even Fox News is. But, you know, the whole idea is that these institutions are somehow better than ordinary people and more honest. Now, lots of ordinary people, lots of people on the Internet are worse liars. They just put out stuff, manipulative stuff, clickbait stuff, whatever it is, right? And it's there's no agency out there. My brother was talking to me about this. Is it the FCC, the Federal Communications, whatever it is, right? And so the FCC was, um, you know, if you had an AM radio and you said the kind of things that were said now in the truth community, they'd shut you down 100%. Like, you know, you could not be nearly as um, opened up about things as you can on social media now. Everyone says social media is censoring, but before they controlled the airwaves and you couldn't get on TV or the radio and put out these various types of ideas even in a mild way, and you'd be censored. I mean, there's heavy censorship. So when the internet opened up, there was a lot more freedom, but of course people being sucky, you know, put out lies and disinformation, and, you know, it wasn't like it was all good stuff. And so now there's more censorship, but the building block of all this stuff is that, you know, individual people are much more dangerous than the government and these powerful institutions in which would never lie to you, or at least, you know, they're much more controlled. That individuals that, you know, would get into a position of power like Trump, who wasn't as handled as Jojo Biden, Jojo Magoo, that Jojo Magoo has all these people telling him what to do and what to say. And Trump had his handlers. He was, you know, he had like big banks and Wall Street and Israel. He had his group of powerful handlers, but he was much more, you know, just like winging it and, you know, tweeting and not acting presidential. Like Joe, Joe, Joe Magoo follows a model of behavior. He's a career politician. And so they wanted to bring that back into the White House because they're anti-individual because the government and the corporations and the media and Hollywood all play by the same rules. And they have oversight. If somebody in a position of power goes off and goes full truther, they have a way to bring those people back. And that's, you know, being demonstrated here across the board. The reason that I'm much lighter about all these things is because I, you know, realized, and I should have known earlier on because, I mean, the heartfulness meditation, some of the teachings in the heartfulness meditation had talked about all these things happening, that this was going to happen. What's happening now needed to happen, the end of our civilization, and it was part of God's plan. It wasn't a bad thing. We would experience it as a bad thing because we're 100% dependent on the system. I've talked about that over and over again. But in terms of the system coming down, it's a good thing. And the people who run the system, and they're certainly responsible for getting people off the farm, But this was also a part of God's plan all along. And so those people, you know, they are responsible, but they're not, right? Like, you know, like they, you know, they made bad decisions and their orientation to life in the world. And they did a lot of bad things, the people I call the controllers. But they're also, you know, following along with what's supposed to happen in the Kali Yuga. So it's like they, you know, they've made bad choices, but they also are doing God's will. It's like a combination of those things. And now they're faced with a collapsing system and they can't come to everybody. We've seen this over and over in movies, right? When the government knows that an asteroid is going to hit the earth and they don't tell the people. Like they keep secrets from the people because they don't think the people are adult enough to handle it. And it's right. It's true. I mean, look at what happened to COVID stuff and people running out to Costco and buying you know, 40 cases of toilet paper. I mean, this is, you know, the panic, taking out money from the banks. I mean, all the things that people end up doing, and that creates you having to go do it 
because you don't want to run out of toilet paper. Now they've, you know, turned it into a, you know, a panic about whatever it might be, right? Canned goods and, you know, all these panic stuff that people panic purchases. And then everything goes back to normal and they forget about it. But then there's another panic and people just flip out. And we know that, you know, the American people can't handle the idea if the government came to you and said, look, our economy isn't as good as we say it is. In fact, it's, you know, on the verge of collapse. Like that would set off panic. And again, this is a system based in perception. As soon as you don't have faith in the dollar and the government, then it collapses because it's a Ponzi scheme. Once you lose faith in the government, then it's all over. My brother had talked about this a while back to me. And my wife asked me this question. We were walking around, I don't know, last week. It was this idea, why don't we just, why doesn't America just default on our debts? Why don't we just say, F you, we're not, you know, in $30 trillion worth of debt, we're not paying. And I said, well, one, that would cause worldwide economic collapse because that $30 $30 trillion is important to the global economy. But also it would mean America, which has a promise to pay system in terms of our economy, the only the only uh, value our dollar has, our money, our currency has, is the American government promises to make good on it. And once the American government starts defaulting on its promises, then the system, everyone loses faith in the system, and the system collapses. So if American politicians came out and said, or whatever it was, world leaders, all right, look, the economy isn't very good, like it's a debt-based economy, and we got to restructure everything. People would, A, lose faith in the system, and the system would, you know, widespread panic. And B, they would say, F you, we're not giving up anything. We're not giving up anything in terms of lifestyle. I mean, that's already being said in terms of climate change. People are like, we don't believe you. We don't believe the climate is changing because you guys are liars. We don't trust you. We don't trust the scientists. So many people don't trust the government, don't trust scientists. And people in general, people are liars. And so anything the government says to you, anything that happens, people are going to question whether it's legitimate or not. That's how it's going to be, like until the collapse of the civilization. People no longer have faith, lots of people, in their fellow human beings, and then all these institutions and governments and science and all these things, even more so. And so all of those things are a recipe for disaster because we have to do something differently, I mean, across the board. And the institutions, the people who are wealthy and the government isn't going to do anything differently. They're not, you know, they're not going to give up anything and they're not going to risk losing their power. And individual people aren't going to change either. And so the system's already doomed for lots of other reasons, but it's more because people will not adapt. They won't adapt. They won't give anything up. They won't you know, change the way they're doing anything. And, you know, they're very, I'm butthurt and easily, you know, emotional and all these things. I might see it every day. And so there's no choice but the system to collapse. And then those people who can make it, who can, you know, survive their way through this and help, you know, rebuild something better, that's the only option. That's the only option on the table. And so there's going to be massive die-offs and I mean, who knows how bad it's going to get and what it's going to look like, but I you know, have a general sense of the thing. And that's why people who are connected to God, because when the system collapses, then you need something else to guide you through. And more importantly, that's the whole reason you're here anyway. It's more important that you connect to, the, connect to God, not just in terms of managing your material life, but because you need a spiritual reason. You need to find your spiritual reason, not a spiritual reason, the spiritual reason why you're here. What's your purpose? What's your soul, you know, what's your soul's purpose? Why, why on a spiritual level, why did your soul choose to be in a body? Like, what are you supposed to do spiritually when you incarnate on planet Earth? And people need to know that. People have to figure that out, right? And, you know, I mean, it will be whatever it is, right? I mean, it's something where We'll see what happens. The heartfulness meditation, I said over and over again, is a system given by divinity at this time to help people make this transition. 
But again, you have to use the system. And, you know, what I've seen over the years, there has to be these events that happen that make people really take that seriously, really take a look at what they are and, you know, have a deep craving to connect to God and really are willing to go through wholesale changes like, like nothing we've ever seen here on planet Earth. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramano. Definitely reporting from the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.